Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. We have exclusive new reporting on a story that has turned Washington upside down and caused more intrigue than anything in the city I've seen in 25 years. As of course you've heard, independent counsel Robert Mueller's investigation has zeroed in on its first targets. Today, former Donald Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort and his business associate Rick Gates were both indicted on charges of money laundering, tax fraud, and failure to report lobbying arrangements. Now, the indictment, among other things, offers tantalizing details about how foreign lobbying actually works at the highest levels in Washington, how Manafort allegedly used laundered offshore cash to buy Range Rovers, expand his wardrobe, somehow spend $655,000 on landscaping for his house in the Hamptons. Manafort's indictment comes as, honestly, no surprise to anyone who's been in Washington for a while and has watched him operate, though, of course, the legal system will make the final call on that. It's pretty clear, though, that Paul Manafort is just the first in a series of people in D.C. who are suddenly in deep, deep trouble. Who's next? Well, reading between the lines of the indictment and talking to a number of our own sources, we think we've got a pretty good idea of that. Keep in mind that today's indictment never mentions Donald Trump's presidential campaign or the 2016 election. It only mentions Russia in passing, even though Russian meddling was the pretext for this investigation in the first place. Instead, the indictment catalogs Manafort's efforts to lobby on behalf of pro-Russia groups in Ukraine. The indictment goes into great detail on the relationship between Manafort and two mysterious groups described in the document as Company A and Company B. Those companies, we can report tonight, are Mercury LLC, that's led by former Republican Congressman Vin Weber, and the Podesta Group, founded by Tony Podesta and his brother John, whom you'll remember as Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman. None of this will come as a shock to viewers of this show. Last Tuesday, we told you that the Mueller investigation is no longer primarily a search for Russian collusion in the 2016 race. It is now a much far-reaching inquiry into corrupt lobbying practices across D.C., one that is very likely to ensnare figures close to Hillary Clinton. In press accounts, Mueller's investigation is still framed as a hunt for collusion between Donald Trump's presidential campaign and the government of Russia. Our source says investigators are, in fact, very interested in Manafort's behavior while he ran the Trump campaign, but otherwise that description is mostly bogus. The investigation has broadened now to determine which people and which organizations in Washington have spent years working secretly as de facto operatives on behalf of Russian government and business interests. The Podesta Group is chief among these. Quote, they are more focused on facilitators of Russian influence in this country, says our source, than they are on election collusion. The Podesta group, he says, quote, is in their crosshairs. Well, that segment, which ran last week, provoked a snarling legal threat from Tony Podesta today designed to shut us up. That's not going to happen, obviously, but we'll tell you a lot more about it in just a minute. Last week, we explained how Manafort, Paul Manafort, used a sham group called the European Center for a Modern Ukraine to lobby on behalf of pro-Russian forces in Ukraine. Those forces sought a number of changes to American policy, changes to the Republican platform, for example. Some of the changes are obviously contrary to America's interests and values. Among them, they wanted the U.S. government to support the imprisonment of one of U the U.K. president's political opponents. Shady does not begin to describe this operation. Even some of Tony Podesta's own employees thought the whole thing was disgusting. Well, today's indictment confirms our reporting on this. It describes the Center for Modern Ukraine as a fake organization, merely, quote, a mouthpiece for the Ukrainian president, Yanukovych. The indictment also confirms that the lobbying groups Manafort hired in Washington, including Tony Podesta's, knew perfectly well that the Center for the Modern Ukraine was fake when they signed on to represent it. According to the feds, Podesta's company was told explicitly they would be lobbying on behalf of the Ukrainian president. In November 2012, the indictment says, Manafort's business partner explicitly requested reports on lobbying activity by both those companies so that he could brief the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, on what they were doing. It couldn't get dirtier. But despite apparently knowing they were acting as foreign agents, agents of a foreign government, the Podesta group never registered as foreign agents. Failure to do that is against the law. In April 2012, the Podesta Group filed documents with Congress relating to its work with the Center for a Modern Ukraine. At the time, they falsely claimed that group was just a foreign NGO. The Podesta Group's filing contained a declaration by the Center for Modern Ukraine that, quote, 
None of the activities of the center are directly or indirectly supervised, directed, controlled, financed, or subsidized in whole or in part by a government of a foreign country or a foreign political party. That declaration, false, was endorsed as true by Kimberly Fritz, now the CEO of the Podesta Group and a former Jeb Bush staffer, all apparently a lie. Moreover, according to today's indictment, the Podesta Group must have known it was a lie when they signed that document. Under the law, the firm should have immediately registered with the government, the U.S. government, under the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Instead, the Podesta Group waited until spring 2017, this year, to do that, and then somehow applied the status retroactively. By that point, the Center for Amadi in Ukraine had effectively been out of business for three years. It was a little late. Interestingly, the Podesta Group filed those late papers just weeks after media outlets began reporting that law enforcement was investigating Manafort's offshore bank accounts. Connection? But wait, why would Ukrainian interests hire Tony Podesta in the first place? Well, according to a former Podesta employee we spoke to over this weekend, even foreign officials in distant lands understood that Tony Podesta's brother was John Podesta, a key Clinton confidant. It was widely known the two brothers had dinner together every Sunday night. Quote, that's not something we hid from clients of the firm. They loved hearing that. Even a native Russian speaker could grasp the point of all of this. The Podesta Group was hired by Paul Manafort on behalf of foreign clients because the company was perceived to have a direct line to powerful politicians. John Podesta was Hillary's campaign chairman. Tony Podesta had been friends with Bill Clinton since the midterm elections of 1970. Influence peddling 101. How central were the Podesta's political connections to their profit model? Consider this. The firm's billing dropped dramatically almost immediately after Hillary Clinton lost the race for president. That tells you a lot. Mueller's investigators apparently have figured this out. Today, Tony possessed Podesta resigned as head of his company. His excuse? Us. That's right. He blamed us. In his parting statement, Podesta said this, quote, it is impossible to run a public affairs firm while you're under attack by Fox News and the right-wing media. Well, Podesta isn't just complaining about us, though. He's threatening us. This afternoon, we got a letter from Jeff Garenther. He's a lawyer with Venable LLP, a big law firm here in D.C. The letter demands that this show, quote, immediately cease and desist disseminating false and misleading reports about Mr. Podesta and the Podesta Group. It demands we retract and delete all our prior reporting on the Podesta Group and warns that if we don't do this, quote, Mr. Podesta may pursue legal action, including for damages, in order to fully protect his rights. The letter doesn't stop there, though. It also warns us that we will face legal action under the Copyright Act merely for quoting from this letter publicly, as we just did. The most amusing line, though, is this one, quote, Paul Manafort did not work with the Podesta Group in its representation of the European Center for a Modern Ukraine. That's what the lawyer's letters told us. Apparently, that lawyer hasn't read the Manafort indictment yet. In paragraph 22 of that indictment, we read this, quote, at the direction of Manafort and Gates, companies A and B engaged in extensive lobbying on Ukraine. The indictment also says that the Podesta Group and Mercury were selected personally by Paul Manafort to lobby on behalf of Ukrainian interests. So if John Podesta's legal team has a complaint, it's not with us, it's with the Department of Justice and the Mueller investigation. But maybe we're being too literal about this, probably so. Podesta's lawyer wasn't trying to inform us of anything, but to threaten us, to shut down our reporting on his client. One lawyer we talked to earlier today said the Podesta people have used this tactic with others before. It's common. It's an effort to use fear to control press coverage. We're not intimidated. We have ample evidence from Mueller's indictment, from a number of confidential sources, to paint a pretty clear picture of exactly what the Podesta group was doing for years here in Washington. We'll let the facts speak for themselves. And we're confident the Mueller investigation will be revealing a lot more about Tony Podesta's lobbying practices in the near future. In the meantime, if you're looking for a summary of all of this, here's the one-sentence cliff note to the whole affair. The chairman of one major presidential campaign colluded with the brother of the chairman of the other major presidential campaign to enrich themselves by secretly advancing the interests of a foreign adversary. That happened. That's the swamp they told you needed to be drained. Jonathan Turley teaches law right in the middle of the swamp. He's a professor at George Washington <laughs> University Law School, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Turley, thanks for coming on. Thank you. So you don't often hear of people prosecuted for violating the FARA Act, the requirement, legal requirement to register as a foreign lobbyist when you lobby for a foreign government. 
A lot of people here do it. Very few, relatively few, right. register. Why is that unenforced? Well, it's only been a handful of prosecutions, and to have it in this mix is odd. It's like you know being chased by a bunch of Rottweilers and a Chihuahua. You know, it's not exactly a fierce charge to face. But it was brought in this case, and I think it sends a signal to others like Flynn, like Tony Podesta, that these are charges that, that could be brought. I think this indictment is, is saying that the special counsel is prepared to, to indict anyone for anything within his mandate. But he's clearly focusing on these types of financial transactions and registration violations. Now, FARA violations are a bit deadly in one sense, and that is some of these violations are registration violations. Jurors tend to treat those as basically cut and dry. If, if they're convinced that you had to file, then you're guilty. So you can secure these types of convictions. But they're in a mix with very serious crimes. Well, but they seem serious. I mean, look, this whole investigation appears to be focused on the question of foreign influence. How do foreign governments affect American policy? Yeah. The decisions our government makes. And there is a law, it seems to be a meaningful one, saying if you're doing the bidding of a foreign power, you have to tell us about it. Why is that considered a small violation? Well, it's small because it's often been dealt with administratively. When you violate it, the response, like the Podesta group did, was to retroactively file. And right. the Department of Justice has allowed that. Clearly, Mueller is not following that pattern. He is taking the view that, you know, if you violated FARA, we can charge you criminally, we will. It'd be hard not to see that charge brought against people like Flynn. You could white out Manafort's name and put in Flynn and basically use for that his, same paragraph. the work he did for the Erdogan government. In That's Turkey. right. Yeah. And so this is a signal to others that these charges are likely to be brought. So if FARA violations are basically looked past and you can retroactively file four or five years and right. call it good, this is an editorial comment, but I'm just interested in your view. Maybe that's one of the reasons DC is so corrupt. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> well, you know, when this first happened, I was when we went into the Russian money. My first response was, Washington's awash with Russian money, and, yes. and, and the public are about to see that. This this city has a real sordid side to and it. And not just Russian money. Absolutely, and people do influence peddle, and there's there, it's not exclusive to any particular party. And so I think what the Democrats are experience with the Republicans is that investigations are a lot like Saturn; they devour their own, and you're going to see an expansion here, clearly, bringing in other people. And the focus does appear by Mueller to be on the lobbying aspect, and you're right. This could actually have, be a historic, uh, you know, this series of disclosures for the public. I think the public has no idea the level of influence they, peddling they in don't. Washington. And I don't care who's swept up in it. If you're working on behalf of a foreign power against American interests, I hope you're exposed. I really do. Well, I think they will be. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Great to see you.